Okay, so I think uh, uh, we're waiting for a last panelist, but he will come in a few minutes. So I think we can start uh, by introducing this uh, round table. So welcome everybody. I'm Stanley Durleman. I'm researcher at INRIA and the Paris Brain Institute, and I'm very honored and pleased to, to moderate this roundtable with uh, um, great people that uh, will introduce themselves in a few minutes. So this is a roundtable of the uh, AI for Health Winter School, uh, which is organized by the Health Data Hub and the three uh, interdisciplinary institutes for artificial intelligence in France. And it's also supported by the French Medical Informatics Association Paris Brain Institutes and the University of Paris. And so we are uh, very glad and extremely glad, grateful uh, to count on the different sponsors that uh, allows us to, to have this uh, event. And the diamond sponsors, Esvier, Huawei, Johnson & Branch, uh, we are represented tonight with us. The gold uh, sponsors, MSD, Pierre Fabre, Pfizer, Sanofi, and the silver sponsor, Amgen, Medtronic, and Quinton. Uh, so you have been listening for a great uh, presentation over the last uh, two days and it will continue tomorrow. And some of you will even practice some of the tools and the concepts that you have learned on AI on Tuesday and Friday. All this program is, however, very focused on, on I would say, algorithms and methods. And that might just represent the tip of the iceberg. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to have these tools deployed in the real world, uh, with real patient, it's, it's often much more difficult than just training a model on some data. And that's exactly what we would like to tackle here on this round table. Uh, and for that, I mean, I, I'm extremely grateful uh, to count on five, uh, great, four great, great panelists that are representative of our sponsor. So um, we have by alphabetical order, uh, Rémi Choquet from Roche. So good evening, Rémi. Hi, everyone. If you can just present you just in, in, in few words for our audience. Yeah, of course. So uh, I and uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Very Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, so I'm Rémi Choquet, the head of the Medical and Personalized Healthcare Evidence Department. So I'm, I'm dealing mainly with data and all my team is, uh, is also dealing with data. And I'm also an associate researcher to an INSER Medical Informatics and Public Health French Research Lab an executive member of the SCAR Data Institute. So I have the ch a chance uh, to lead a great team of uh, 16 experts in SCAR data, pharmacoepidemiology, biomedical data science, uh, partnership managers and project managers. And our job, day-to-day -day job, is to make sure that we have proper data and strong scientifically grounded evidence to support the go-to-market of our innovative medicine and oncology, hematology, hemophilia, neurological and rare disease area. So in my day-to-day -day job is very simple and given my background in medical informatics and public health data, I connect the dots, uh, I network data, science and people, I contribute also, for example, in building a French infrastructure for data highways, because uh, there is never enough data and maybe never enough data at the right time for us and the timing is an issue also in our day-to-day -day job. There are many opportunities in EHR world and you know, all this data that is being generated today that we are trying to, 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 to work on. And uh, together, uh, just a, a word, quick word about Roche because Roche is Roche Pharma, but it's also Roche Diagnostic, the Institute Roche that is looking for translational science. So just a, a global word about what we think about AI that we firmly believe that AI can help in detection, in detecting patients faster so that they can profit, you know, about the new technology, eventually molecule that will be, uh, that will hit the market and that will help us also to, to multiply the opportunities to make science through collaboration. So uh, this is really something that is important for us as many other uh, pharma and many other peers in the industry. So I'm happy to be there with you for this panel with uh, the three other folks. Thank you. Thank you, Remy, and I. We are looking forward to, to, to hearing more about your experience at, at Roche in, uh, in the next hour. So we have Marwan Deba from uh, Huawei. Good evening, Marwan. Good, good evening. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Marwan Deba, and I'm director of the R&D of Huawei in France. Uh, I'm a specialist of um, AI and telecommunication, mostly wireless. So most of you, I think, know the company Huawei, and I think it's quite relevant uh, with respect to the theme of this roundtable. 
We work on four domains specifically. One is what we call the infrastructure carrier business, where we provide infrastructure or the pipes uh, to uh, the majority of carriers in the world. The second is the consumer, and for which basically we've been building a lot of devices which are related to um, e-health and health perspectives. The third one is basically providing also what we call the data centers and the storage capability to the enterprise business. And the last one, which has been growing quite fast, is of course our AI capability that we're bringing at the same time at the cloud, um, I would say, uh, uh, perspective, but also on the device and edge for a fog perspective. Uh, in uh, in uh, France, in Europe, uh, we've been basically mostly working on intensively on uh, the application of AI and, build, and building basically some uh, um, uh, frameworks related to, to our business. And in particular in France, which uh, is the uh, business I know very well, uh, we work mostly on uh, basically, um, in, at least in Grenoble, uh, in our center, related to everything which corresponds to sensors uh, with respect to our devices, wearables, IoT, uh, whereas in Paris, we're mostly working working on algorithms related to uh, to uh, the AI perspective. Thank you, Manuel. So we have also Rifa from Elsevier. Good evening, Rui. Happy to, to see you here. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you um, for having me here. Um, I'm glad to to um, uh, have a roundtable discussion with you uh, on uh, behalf of um, my company, Airsphere. Um, 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 myself, um, I have had uh, the uh, more than 10 years um, experience in, in uh, academia um, before I joined uh, Airsphere. I, uh, um, my research, including uh, signal processing, uh, bioinformatics, and uh, computational biology in the um, uh, many UK uh, university and uh, um, research institutes. Um, uh, after I joined SVR uh, as a research uh, um, scientist in precision medicine, my uh, research uh, uh, focuses the uh, deep learning and the machine learning um, uh, in the uh, health uh, data analytics and uh, some um, related fields. Um, so my company, Airsphere, is um, as may maybe um, many of uh, you know uh, about uh, Airsphere. Um, uh, Airsphere is uh, one of the greatest, uh, uh, largest um, publisher in the uh, healthcare and uh, medicine field. Um, so uh, uh, we have uh, many uh, products um, using our um, text mining tools, um, mining our uh, publishing um, uh, text and to provide our customers uh, uh, the health, health analytic uh, tools. And so um, uh, our team, um, mainly um, uh, collaborates with um, many uh, hospitals and uh, insurance companies uh, working on the uh, um, electronic health uh, record and uh, some claim data to to um, provide the, um, the insight um, uh, in the in the uh, health data yeah. Yeah. thank you Thank you, Ori. And last but not least, we have Nigel Hughes from Johnson, Johnson & Johnson Company. Good evening. Thank you, Stan. Hi. Hello. Hello. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I'm a scientific director based in the epidemiology group within research and development at uh, Janssen. Uh, a broad background in healthcare from clinical through to um, um, voluntary sector right through to, uh, to commercial and, and R&D uh, within the industry. And uh, currently, say working within uh, within Janssen. Janssen is uh, the pharmaceutical division of uh, Johnson and Johnson, the largest diversified healthcare company globally, um, focused in, in multiple therapeutic areas. And uh, like probably all of my counterparts on this uh, on this uh, panel and uh, across the industry, seeing a rapid rise in the utilization of data science, and important importantly, data scientists. Um, in terms of utilizing machine learning, uh, AI, and other aspects from discovery through to post authorization, inclusive of development in the middle. Um, myself, in my particular role, actually, I focus more on, on, on 
from data networks. I'm, uh, for most of my time, uh, project lead uh, with my uh, academic uh, counterpart, uh, Associate Professor Peter Weinberg at Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, uh, co-coordinating co EDEN, the European Health Data and Evidence Network, which I think is probably now the largest project of its kind working on a, a federated data network to support observational real-world research, federated uh, machine learning and AI, um, and numerous other initiatives in between uh, within, within, within Europe. We're an IMI project, Innovative Medicines Initiative, so it's a public-private partnership funded by the European Commission and industry. And we have 22 partners, uh, academic, uh, NGOs, uh, HTA bodies, uh, SMEs, small to medium-sized enterprises, um, and pharmaceutical companies as well, uh, all working on a, a five-year project to develop uh, the sustainable infrastructure for the years and decades to come around this area and of course AI being what it is it uh, consumes data like a voracious monster so we need to desperately need these kind of initiatives that fit within both uh, the socio-technical constructs that support uh, support this whether it's from uh, privacy and security requirements right through to technological and methodological uh, aspects to, to utilizing uh, so-called real-world data. Thank you for uh, for for the uh, invitation to participate today. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. Um, so I, I have a first first question for, for you because um, I think that most of the students uh, tackle this field of, of uh, AI for us by the way of data challenges. So we provide them with a uh, with data sets. Uh, usually it's well curated, and you have a clear uh, clear question to uh, to to optimize. So you maximize your F one score or your area under the curve or whatsoever. And then you benchmark different algorithms. But uh, this hides uh, many uh, difficulties. And I think that the, the most important difficulties is the question which is asked. And what is the objective that you want to achieve? An objective that makes sense and makes value, value for, uh, for the patient, value for the practitioners, value for the payers, for the healthcare system in general. And, and this is, of course, the, the key question we need to start uh, answering when we, uh, we are dealing in this um, with these problems. Uh, so, for instance, Rui, in, at Elsevier, I know you had some um, uh, data science projects uh, running, and how did you uh, solve and address uh, these problems of defining what, where is the, the clear relevance of the project for, for the healthcare system? There's um, many um... There's many uh, difficulties uh, during this, uh, uh, this uh, modeling using the hash, uh, and, um, data analytics. So the um, uh, w w what we do is the um, the collaboration with the physician is very important. So it, it actually is the start point of the uh, uh, any project. So firstly, we have to. Um, Clarify the question and uh, uh, clarify the the um, the the, uh, the task, clinical task, and to uh, because there are so many uh, clinical tasks um, in the um, in the real world. So uh, there are so many diseases area and these uh, many kind of um, um, clinical question to answer. So we have to have a um, very clear um, um, definition of the the uh, um, the task um, and these tasks should be written into the uh, protocol um, without any uh, ambiguousness and the, the uh, and then the the uh, criteria could be um, implemented to uh, model um, flawless. So yeah, the, the, the communication should be very uh, important. Sure, can you give us maybe one or two examples of what you, you did at Elsevier in this, in this respect? Yeah, um, well, it, it, uh, example we have uh, currently with the collaboration with uh, French um, hospital is we are uh, um, uh, calculating the uh, index for the uh, the adver uh, adverse events um, 
which is kind of the uh, um, adverse, um, um, which is um, um, which occurred during the hospital stay. Um, um, and so, so this um, to define this adverse event, we we have very uh, need to. Um, very clear definition of this uh, um, um, exclusion and the inclusion criteria um, to to uh, give very um, clear um, guideline for us to um, to do the uh, filtering in the uh, uh, in the in the from the raw data. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so Remy Choquet from, from Roche, so you also, uh, of course, have a lot of uh, projects in, uh, in AI and the, and the domain of health. So how do you deal with this uh, question? How do you define your projects? Well, first, I think uh, being a pharmaceutical and diagnostic company, uh, we, we know this question of clinical relevance. It is in our, has always been in the heart of what we do. So I think, you know, the, 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 the impact and the outcome, uh, we are obsessed with outcome, you know, and the value and the medical value and eventually the economic value and so on and so forth. It's not always easy to bring all them together. I mean, there is no one solution for, you know, to, for... Uh, medical plus economical value, but what it does, we are very happy about. Just to say that clinical relevance, and I think especially in the AI uh, segment, as it was just said before, there are thousands of possible use cases. And often we see, you know, a lot of people spending time and resources where they think it could be nice to do such as human, but if a human can do it, you know, sometimes you just ask yourself, why are, what are you trying to resolve? Is it easy to resolve it? And can it scale uh, at, a, at a larger scale? And I think we saw some example, even from big uh, uh, digital uh, company in the US, I will not name any, but just to see how difficult it is to actually do what a human is doing um, when we talk about clinical decision, for instance. Clinical decision is something often a lot of people are trying to reach through AI, uh, but it's one of the most complex tasks uh, in a way. So it's not only one data type, it's many data types, many types of AI that should be brought, you know, into the machine, which could be um, symbolic, it could be, you know, symbolic rezoning, it could be based on uh, machine learning, it could be based on so many other, and also, you know, decision trees, and you can add up some of those kind of, uh, you know, mechanism, and it's not, it's, it's very complex. I will give, maybe just give two examples about uh, where and how, what we, we've been working on, and it's very uh, simple in a way, or it's soon simple, but uh, even something that soon simple is not so simple. If you take the oncology space, there is a, a, a big, we, we think there is a big revolution coming in that space because um, in the pathology, digital pathology area, you know, this is the, the, the slides, uh, the pathologists will look, on the tumor to identify um, the type of tumor it is. And the tumor type is very important because the new drugs that are coming on the market are very nailed, you know, built to actually fight that tumor type and that precise tumor type. So identifying that tumor type is something that is crucial to make sure that the patient will, uh, will, will have the right medicine. Just to give you a, an example, in, in a BGC, a paper was published, a systematic review was published uh, later at, uh, at the end of 2020, and that showed that upon 44 papers that was trying to build AI algorithm to help the pathologists to do their work and identify these tumor types, um, only one got a, a FDA approval. You know, it just shows you know the, the road uh, that still has to be to to to, to come through, and. Uh, in, in all of them, in fact, half of them, uh, so it was on prostate cancer detection, non in tumor subtyping, no survival prediction. Prediction is a very, very complex task, even if you have, you know, this kind of data. Mutation prediction or response prediction. So prediction in, in, in it is something that is very um, wanted, but very complex to, to attain. And even with one type of data, you need to adapt. And it, generally, it's what's happening. I mean, they start with a, a data type, and then after they said, oh, uh, yeah, okay, so we can do like uh, the pathologist, but I need more data if I want to do like the, the physician that we treat the patient. So you end up into a, a, a project that already took you five years to try to identify, you know, one one type of patient, and then you end up into 
a massive project with a lot of variables to try to mimic what human is doing. But just to say that in that area, for instance, what we did at Roche, it was uh, two years ago, when the, the, a drug came on the market for the breast cancer, uh, there are some type of uh, immunoprofile that should uh, be uh, seen by pathologies, which is a EH, e -I -H -A -H -E -R 2 uh, type. And uh, to read that on the pathology slide, we've worked with the, the, the Pathology Society of France to, to understand if the, the work was, was goodly done because they are actually making sure that in France, the quality of the reading is, is homogeneous on the territory. So we work with them and we, 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 uh, we, we found out that uh, it was about 2,000 women per year that was being uh, um, diagnosed. And over 4% of them, uh, the reading was not very well done and not homogeneous from a center to the other. So instead of developing a specific algorithm uh, for the pathologist, we developed an algorithm for the uh, medical society to make sure that they can identify the center that could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, that could read better the, the, and they could learn from the other because in some complex situation, the reading of this uh, uh, status, HR2 plus, is not very well done and is very complex in France. So we, you know, we use the proxy to actually develop uh, uh, an algorithm that would help them to actually uh, uh, enhance the way it's it's been done in France, um, and one of the reason of that is because the digital the pathology in France are not digital yet, so it's very difficult to go into the machine. And if you go into the machine, you go into uh, the digital pathology machine for clinical decision support. You're going into a very uh, uh, a medical device, in fact. So you know the. Uh, the, 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 the entry point is very uh, different. The second point may be because generally I divide AI in two aspects in, in health. The first one is understanding. When you want to understand something you don't understand, you cannot build a model, a traditional mathematical model. It's nice to use AI if you have a lot of data to, be, to compare. And then after also the decision making. So the decision making is complex, but on the understanding, we did also uh, another uh, experimentation on the multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a disease uh, that is uh, not very well understood the way it evolves. For a patient to the other is very different. So it's very key for the researcher and for the pharmaceutical company to understand, you know, how it evolves from a patient to the other. So. The, Understanding that is, com is it's, it's complex because the, 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 what you want to monitor in terms of data, you don't know it up front and the, the disease can evolve for 15 years, for instance. So it's very, you know, it's a very long time. So we developed some, some algorithm for, for the, for the, for the, for the uh, mobile phone, for instance, where they can do some cognitive uh, test and physiological test, the patient themselves. And we prove that uh, we can uh, redo what was done by a human uh, in the device itself. Uh, so it was a good point for us. Uh, the, the drawback, though, was that uh, this kind of device was uh, reminding the patient that it was ill. And, 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 and hence, it, you know, it, it just showed that uh, it, it's not because you have the technology that it will be accepted by the patient or by all patients. And the second drawback of this uh, uh, experimentation we did in France and that is being done in other parts of the world uh, for this disease uh, is that uh, it's, it's not so easy to integrate that kind of tool in the clinical workflow. And it was one of the issues also, you know, the interoperability issue with the care system, the time that we spend into reading this data uh, compared to doing, asking the nurse to do a test. So, you know, how it is used in clinical routine practice is something that is uh, very important. So we, we do strongly believe at Roche that together with medicine, diagnostic, we need other tools to actually help the healthcare system, help to capture new knowledge about disease, about the effect of a drug, but also about the disease. But, you know, integrating that uh, uh, into clinical practice is something that is still a challenge, even if you have you are in a very big company. <laughs> so, yeah, I can believe it. Um, so it makes a perfect transition with the, the second aspect I would like to tackle is the, the data management aspect. It's also something that is completely hidden when you have a data challenge. You come with a very nice and smooth and well-treated data set, but real data does not come in that form. 
And uh, I'm used to say that 80% of the work is just cleaning data and curating data and making sure data are of high quality. And the only way you can ensure the uh, a relevant uh, output uh, uh, and and to have models that can generalize in, in the real world. Uh, Ori, you told us that you have uh, worked on uh, electronic health records, and that's typically type of data that are pretty crude, I would say. Um, maybe can you can share with us some uh, of your experience when dealing with this uh, this type of uh, of data? Yeah, um, the the um, characteristic of this um, uh, has um, uh, electronic health records data is um, the um, firstly is um, uh, main uh, primarily used for the. Uh, daily care and uh, uh, billing purposes, uh, admin, administrative uh, purposes, uh, not um, primarily for the data analysis. So um, data analysis is just only the, the second use of this uh, type of data. Uh, and the, the, the second is um, for modeling, um, we use the uh, retrospective, um, uh, way of uh, modeling. So, so these two characteristic uh, leads, uh, lead to kind of um, the, the um, um, missing value uh, of the data and we also have the uh, problem of the uh, irregular, uh, irregularly sampled data. So, because it's um, uh, retrospective, so we cannot go back to resample the, the patient to get the, the data back. And um, um, if if we uh, if the the the, the primary uh, if, if it's primary use for data analysis, then we can uh, pre uh, a kind of design the, the model to uh, the way how we collect the data. So. That that is the reality. So we have to um, design uh, well um, the 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 uh, our uh, modeling to tackle these uh, issues. Um, so for for my uh, um, our example is um, dealing with the uh, EHR data. We have to uh, uh, as I mentioned, that we we have to uh, uh, work with the clinician to make our um, question or um, the 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 um, clinical task clear, and then we uh, need to um, build the pipeline to for the um, um, for the uh, modeling to use this retro uh, retrospective data to build the model. And then we apply, uh, uh, generalize the model in the um, um, prospective data, and uh, probably the the uh, clinical um, uh, trial also need to be applied to test the um, um, if um, uh, the 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 uh, efficacy of the uh, modeling. Um, so yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, and Nigel, you you're also working with the Health Data Hub, uh, so which is by definition a federation of databases. Um, how do you work with this problem of working with multiple databases? No, uh, thank thank you very much, Tali. Um, so I think I think sadly to use a topical uh, content uh, is, is is related to COVID nineteen, of course. Um, and probably best to describe some of the activity around around this since last year, which, as you say, also incorporates the French Data Hub more latterly. Um, so, Eden, the uh, the project I described earlier, the European Health Data and Evidence Network, is actually part of a more global network called Odyssey, OHDSI, with the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics um, uh, collaboration. It's worldwide, uh, open science kind of framework centered very much around using a common data model, uh, the OMOP common data, mod uh, common data model. Um, if anyone is uh, watching this, just wants to Google OHDSI or OMOP, OMOP, uh, you'll get more details from the odyssey.org website, of course, as well. 
it's certainly also looking to work in a kind of fair way, you know, sustainable, so accessible, interoperable, and reusable with these principles that have been outlined for some time now. Um, but uh, around March of last year, which is not that long after the uh, the inception of the pandemic, as we know it now, um, we had a so-called study-a-thon, but this is a four-day session uh, with about 150 participants from multiple countries all over the world, including uh, multiple data sources from all over the world, Southeast Asia, Europe, North America, and so on, to work on uh, studies, um, phenotypic work, uh, characterization uh, studies, uh, right through to um, effect estimation studies. So, for example, looking the uh, looking at the impact of repurposed drugs. Some of you may be familiar with. It's quite topical in France, of course. Hydroxychloroquine, <laughs> uh, which became quite uh, quite a cause celeb, unfortunately, um, and uh, the impact of that uh, uh, on on COVID nineteen at the time at the, in March of last year, and uh, but also patient level prediction studies as well and, and actually trying to evaluate um, in, in both characterization and, 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 and prediction you know what was happening in COVID-19 versus shall we say season, seasonal flu uh, patients from prior five years for instance seasonal flu uh, uh, cases uh, and also those uh, who would require hospitalization and in, in particular critical care intensive care uh, uh, um, admission as well, um, so to, to create some prediction models around this. And this is all, as you said earlier, I think using federated data. Um, so the principle is, is that, uh, I think you mentioned this at the outset of this particular aspect, uh, Stanley, is that we spend about 80% of our time on data curation before we get to the sexy bit, uh, doing the analysis, doing the prediction work and so on, and developing algorithms and, and, and all these kind of nice things. Um, and of course, uh, as uh, as was mentioned earlier, I think by Rue um, and and Remy uh, can only requalify what they both said. You know, real world data is messy. It's actually a, a byproduct of clinical use. Uh, so we're effectively using other people's rubbish, <laughs> like I can put it so bluntly, um, to uh, to do this kind of work. And and we do need to do an awful lot of curation work, therefore, and to truly understand the data uh, before even you know doing the data curation, cleaning work, and so forth. Um, to try and uh, to accelerate this, uh, working on data harmonization, standardization processes using things like common data models, you can keep data local. So, for instance, in collaborating with uh, the health uh, the health data hub, for instance, French data should stay where it is. It should stay behind local firewalls and local governance and so on. Um, but but actually then uh, map that if you like, but do some ETL work to a cost a, a standardized common data model. Um, and do that uh, in a reproducible and consistent manner amongst multiple data sources, whether they're electronic health records, claims data, registries and regional cohorts, uh, and so on, national databases and, and so forth as well. Um, whereas everyone then has a local version of a, ma a mapped version to a common data model behind their own firewall. And then you can interrogate this remotely, of course. So this kind of aspect of so-called data access is really about remote analysis. It's not about moving any data. It's about moving the query, if you like, to where the data is in a reproducible manner. You're then utilizing standardized analytical tools on top of that, inclusive of up to uh, prediction modeling and so on, um, in this so-called federated manner. So under things like GDPR, which I know we'll come to later, but kind of privacy requirements, it's kind of privacy by design, if you like. Um, and so importantly, uh, we had this study a thon. Uh, numerous uh, publications have come out for, at the time in preprint, but certainly in journals subsequently uh, on that work. And there's ongoing protocols now internationally around um, effect estimation, you know, continuing therapies, uh, whether novel or repurposed vaccines, of course, very topical right now, um, but also uh, in, in terms of prediction modeling and, and so forth as well. Um, so that's ongoing work. And then what we did within the Eden Project uh, immediately after uh, the March study thon is we had a collaboration call. We have a number of calls for data partners to work with the project to receive a number of things, funding, technical support and expertise via trained and certified SMEs. Um, but overall, the opportunity to, to map their data, whatever it may be, to the common data model and then work within a federated research open science network. And we had a COVID-19 call, uh, topically in April and May, and the French Data Hub was one of the selected partners and is now mapping select COVID-19 data to the common data model, as are 24 other data partners across uh, 16 countries, including France and Europe. And so we have, you know, kind of considerable, uh, and unfortunately have grown over the last year, 
uh, amount of data which we'll be then working to, to develop further studies on and inclusive of looking at things like prediction work and so on in the future. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of work at scale. Uh, one shouldn't take that under any illusion about the work that's required. But once done uh, and, and continued, of course, it's not it's not a one off, uh, but maintained, this should reduce this, this, this necessity for curation work, uh, particularly in working with real world data, but also ensure us ensure that we have greater insights into the type of data being utilized. And I think in particular to to Ruth's uh, comments earlier, you know, the clinical application, I think you mentioned that as well, Remy, um, but well, you know, particularly the clinical application in terms of utilization of these tools in the right way, uh, with a greater confidence, I think, for clinicians, public health, and you know, policymakers and others in using some of these tools. I should stop there because I could talk for hours, as you probably can guess already. Thank you, Nigel. Yes, you will have the opportunity to, to, to go to first. Um, you coined this concept of fair verification, so findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, which is actually key in this data management aspect. Um, Remy at Roche, is that also a, a, key, a key thing? We can't hear you, Remy. You, 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 the microphone. Sorry. Yeah, that that movement because I think fair is a, a, both a concept, a movement, uh, you know, an objective that we we should all share in a way or other from the research world, and that's something. Yeah, at Rush, we 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 uh, we actually yeah worked on for for a few years now, because mm -hmm. you know there is something that we know is that you know data is 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 complex to 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 gather qualitative data is even more complex i mean we have clinical trials much more as well because they are they are, they are built to 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 answer some question but for all other data but even this one you know is something we should care about and uh, this is something you know we we've started uh, at Roche because we know that data project is 80 percent data management project first and then after you can as nigel was saying do the the, 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 the nice work for data scientists um so so in a way or the other you know we, we we whether we are talking of primary data capture or secondary data capture or reuse uh but even if you do that you know you just simply transfer the work you would do manually to the data into uh, into a curation work so you know the the what we win between curation and and sometimes is not is not so so easy so the more we can uh, industrialized, the better it is. And, and really, I, I am looking at uh, Eden, and I was looking at OH, uh, ODC, and, and there are other initiatives like that. And I think that should be encouraged because I think that they, they clearly help the, the, the whole ecosystem, even if, of course, uh, today it's not easy to ask uh, uh, a pre ask a question to this kind of network uh, as we do for French data set, but it's something we are looking very excitedly at Roche. So, just to say that, yeah, we do. So, just I would like people to understand it's not because you have access to the data that was used for a, by a physician to cure a patient, and you have access to thousands of them that you can extract something tangible you know scientifically grounded out of it just remember that in the umls which is a unified language medical system uh, that is a, a, a dictionary of medical terms that exist in the us this dictionary is, is there is four million terms in it four million concepts in this dictionary which means that whatever data you will get from a medical record for a discharge, discharge letter or whatever that is written by a human if you want to understand it, you have to you know to, to to link it to this medical term, and maybe you have a, a first glimpse about what means the data. But even if you do that, you don't understand in which context the data was collected, and it's very you know that's something that is very difficult sometimes to to reuse. So this said, just to say that you know our Russia, yeah, we we strongly support data reuse, and I think uh, uh, we do subscribe to fair, and we have been you know, working a lot at global level for clinical trial data, but at local level as well in France, into cataloging our data, you know, putting our data into a fair uh, model principle to make sure that it could be shared uh, outside of Roche. It could be shared for, and you know, for researchers that are interested into having access to our data in a way or the other, clinical trial data, real world data, uh, the same. And just to say also that, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, doing that is, is something that we think will generate more science, more evidence, but it's also uh, a lot of work because uh, 
you don't only generate and consume the data for yourself, and you have to make sure that people can understand this data, M much more as it was uh, true in, in France, for instance, uh, with the National Data Hub. You know, it's not so obvious to understand the data of a claim database that is a national database when you want to, to, to do something. So people are, I guess, are not, uh, uh, are not what to say that. Uh, it, it takes time to, to make sure that the data is properly uh, shared, uh, but the ecosystem in itself, I think, is no understanding that there is much more value into resharing the data and connecting it to other systems. And I think that's something we also uh, do. We, we've worked, for instance, uh, when it's possible, this is something we are trying to do, when it's possible is to reuse data from hospital. We had a project that is called PRM for Personalized Reimbursement Model. We connect data mm -hmm. from 120 mm -hmm. hospitals in France in oncology space, and we collect the data from the uh, from the prescription software for chemotherapy. But by doing that, you know, you at the beginning of the day of your journey, you think it is very simple because people prescribe the same drugs. You know, the, the care is the same in France and so on and so forth. The only problem is that generally physicians don't use the system the same way. So you have to make sure you put proper rules into your system to make sure that the data could be compared from a patient or from a center to the other. Uh, and this is something that is often, uh, you know, uh, uh, misunderstood uh, when you try to, to do that. So um, we also know that uh, clinical trial data is uh, of very high quality because it's, it's being monitored, it's being, you know, uh, captured exactly for a specific purpose. And now what we do, and we try to do more and more, it's not always the case, but it's more and more like that. When we do clinical trial, if we can get some extra data, such as radio radiological exams to identify a biomarker, we reuse that data into AI, you know, at, at, at the clinical trial level, into an AI uh, project to, to, for example, to develop a biomarker uh, uh, algorithm so that if the if by chance the, the, the clinical trial is, uh, is positive, mm -hmm. we will upfront have a, uh, uh, an algorithm to, 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 to accelerate the biomarking uh, identification of this patient in real life. So that's also something we are, we are uh, trying uh, to do. So generally speaking, data management is a key thing. You cannot data manage upfront or everything that is done, but when we can, we connect with our uh, local ecosystem, uh, hospitals, reusing data, making sure we can share our data, and making building catalogs so that researchers can 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 have access to raw data is something we are also doing uh, locally. So very very happy to hear that the pharma companies are ready to share their data with uh, academic researchers. It's, it's well noted. <laughs> we can. <laughs> and, Talk about that uh, later. Uh, we at Elsevier, so you're not a pharma company, you're a publisher. And during your project, uh, like to show your experience now, you, you deal with these data management aspects. Yes. In the, um, so the, for the um, data management, uh, we, um, uh, for for my team, we uh, don't uh, we, we don't worry about that much because uh, we collaborate collaborate with uh, our um, partner and uh, uh, our partner build that uh, the, the um, data tank for us and we uh, access uh, the, the firewall from the um, the the their. Um, Kind of system and uh, and uh, um, uh, analyze the data on their uh, machines. Um, so, but um, I should add uh, more uh, at one point to the um, about the EHR data because I I, I thought I, I made a, a bad uh, assumption that everyone knows EHR data. So so um, um, for me. Um, I mean, uh, EHR data is kind of currently is uh, uh, generally stored in the uh, 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 relational uh, database. So it, it's um, uh, which is structured with well-defined schema, 
and uh, consists of um, many uh, tables and uh, it has um, uh, um, many uh, information uh, related to the uh, patient, mm -hmm. for example, demography uh, information, the uh, lab test taken from the visit, uh, and uh, the uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, and also some uh, unstructured data, unstructured data, uh, for example, clinical notes. Um, so it's a kind of um, many different type of data um, uh, collection. So um, and also the uh, different. Um, for different um, um, healthcare system, it may have uh, the, the EHR data may contain uh, different information. For example, uh, EHR uh, for intensive care units have more uh, information for acute diseases, or less information for uh, chronic uh, diseases than the um, primary care or uh, secondary care. So. So we have to um, uh, firstly to um, uh, know about what type of the EHR data uh, we have. So currently in the um, um, publicly uh, acceptable um, uh, data, EHR data for research uh, is uh, MIMIC data and uh, uh, EICU data. So they are mainly the the um, intensive care units, so it's difficult to to um, build a model for um, using those data to uh, for the uh, data um, like a, a disease progression um, um, research. So that is a bit uh, difficult. Um, and uh, another important. Um, uh, uh, pain point for us um, modeling is the missing values. So the EHR data is uh, contain a lot of missing values and uh, is high um, uh, dimensional and uh, data, uh, time varied uh, data. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much uh, for sharing this with us. Um, there is another aspect I would like to discuss. It's also the deployment. Because, okay, you have a, uh, you found your data, you curated the data, you train your algorithm. It works, it good, good result. The question is good. And so you can start thinking about how you will deploy that in the real world. And then comes another set of problems. <laughs> it's not the end of the, of the world. And of course, uh, you're smiling, and uh, I look at you, Merwan, because uh, Huawei, this is your business to deploy uh, artificial intelligence system in the real world. So, uh, how do you do that? Yeah, so that, that's a good point. I think you, you've been you've been focusing too much on data, and of course, the problem is how you create that data and how you generate it, how you store it, how you you move it around. I think uh, there are three things when you consider basically mm -hmm. building a, a consistent, I would say, a health system. The first one is is of course devices. And the devices play a very important role. Uh, uh, devices like smartphones, wearables, uh, smart home devices, telematics, and all these things, you see them in hospitals, uh, uh, in, in screens and everywhere. The second, of course, is the connectivity for which you have to do the right choices. And uh, what I mean here by connectivity basically is that uh, the kind of, of data that you're going to pour in for IoT, on which you're going to choose a very specific technology like narrowbound IoT, Sigfox, LoRa, or even 5G is going to be totally different if you're looking at more broadband, basically, perspective in terms of that. And, and of course, the energy efficiency is going to be happening. And the third one is, of course, the computing aspect. And I think uh, the computing aspect today has been very cloudified. We'll talk about it. And I think the way also, basically, you provide what we call a public cloud, a hybrid cloud, and with all the services and, and, and also apps which are behind are very important. So you need the, these three components. So we had. In Huawei, of course, a very large experiences with that. And, and, and I would say that the biggest experience was exactly uh, uh, building recently a hospital within 10 days. As you know, within the pandemic in China, in, in uh, Hunchen Chan Hospital, it took us 10 days to provide all these three aspects to be able to provide the whole digital platform for those hospitals that we were able to build. And I think the choices we made in terms of 
backing up basically uh, 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 LTE with 5G in case things fall down, the ability to connect doctors with Beijing, which could not, of course, move to the hospital in, in, in uh, Wuchan, basically played a very important role for us in how we could do that. And I think uh, uh, these three aspects are often neglected in the sense that um, how you interface them is very important uh, and how you make those right choices in terms of who is going to be providing you that and also the security uh, aspects which are going to be behind. Um, I'm going to focus here more on, on, on basically the, the, the um, big thing that we realized quite rapidly is that when we started understanding be better uh, these three components, which are basically where you store, how you connect, and basically the devices, we realized quite rapidly, um, in our case, that the classical frameworks, which are used today, like TensorFlow, Apache, Cafe, and others, are not really tailored for cases where basically data is quite distributed uh, in every pieces of your network. What I mean by that is that when you start develop developing any kind of a machine learning tool in Python, then it's very hard basically to put it on an IoT device because of all the different constraints that you have, and then also port it to more things which are screen and things which are more in the cloud. So we worked a lot, for example, in our case, to provide a new kind of framework called MindScore, which basically enables, of course, to port your code in uh, various aspects. And this is something that uh, we've been working since three years because basically we, we are more focused on what we call end-to-end -end solutions. And, and I think this is a very uh, 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 specific feature of our company. We're still trying to improve it. It's not very easy because, of course, as you know, having a very generic uh, uh, solution has also some drawbacks. Uh, whenever you do something very tailored, then in that case, of course, you gain and optimize in all the different pieces and dimensions that you can consider. But uh, th this was a, a very good experience for us, this uh, uh, building of, of a, a whole digital has hospital within a 10 year, uh, a 10 days, I would say, perspective with all that pressure uh, th that we had of, of not being able to move our guys, doing things distantly, and also building more and more wireless, I would say, uh, features around that. Yeah, excellent. Uh, uh, so, uh, Remy at, uh, at Hosh, do you also deploy some, uh, you said you're it's not only a pharma company, but also a diagnostic company, so you, you're dealing with with deployment of tools in the, in the real world. So uh, can you give us a few examples? Yeah, uh, yeah, we are a diagnostic company, but you know, as I told you with uh, Pharma, uh, we also did some work, for instance, in uh, uh, relapse uh, tracking for patients with oncology through apps and uh, things like that in the past. And what I can say is like, yeah, well, first is it takes time to develop, whether it's an AI, whether it's a digital application that will be classified as a medical device, whether it's a, it's a drug or it's a diagnostic solution, you know, the time span is different, but at the end of the day, you know, it's something that will hit the patient. So it has to be, you know, make it done. And then after you have to deploy it. Uh, it's not it's not because you can do that with drugs or with uh, uh, with uh, diagnostic uh, machines that you can you know just you know jump into the, the digital market you know as easy as that so so I think we we need to partner to be to be honest and we do partner more and more because the digital market is 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 uh, is a market that has its own rules its own constraints. Uh, and uh, uh, being interfaced with an information system is not the same as you know, uh, mm -hmm. providing a drug. So, of course, there are some um, uh, partners upon which we work with. For example, I'm thinking about G, and I'm thinking also about it. And I will just give you an example. Uh, well, first, to have something successful, I think we should make sure that we do not reinvent the wheel. I mean, going to a market in such markets, such as the healthcare, through, for diagnostic uh, in, embedded with AI or, you know, digital uh, solution, EHR, whatever. I mean, there are people already on the market and there are companies that, that, that spend time in, for go to market. So I think I'm thinking about GE um, uh, because we work with them for diagnostics and integrating AI developed, you know, algorithm, robust one into their technology because the, the machines are there. I mean, you just have to you know, push them like a iPhone, it's a big one. Uh, you, you, you just have it's not so simple uh, to actually, you know, uh, uh, make your 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 uh, innovation going through that market. But uh, uh, 
I will take an example on ophthalmology. It's an interesting example. Mm -hmm. uh, ophthalmology, we know that there is a medical need because early detection of uh, uh, and treatment of retinal condition are very critical to improve and protect the visual function. Uh, and many people we know are untreated or treating too late. You take, for example, diabetic retinopathy or neovascular age-related macular degeneration, and you know that late detection is, is, at the end of the day, not good for the patient and not good for the healthcare system. So how do we tackle that? And, uh, and we know that in that field, uh, there are optometrists, there are a machine to read uh, your retinal, but we, we, will you read the retinal uh, uh, image from all the patients uh, that have a certain age, or maybe for all the patients that have a, a, a specific genetic uh, predisposition to develop this disease. So this is the route we could choose. And then after, how do you develop this retinal uh, um, AI? But once you've done that, and if you have a, a, a nice uh, algorithm, and we know that in, uh, in retinal uh, reading, uh, uh, AI works pretty well, uh, how do you then deploy that? I mean, one way could be and should be, I guess, uh, to have a solution that could be deployed through a, a retinal imaging solution that are already on the market or that uh, will be on the market. And that's something, you know, uh, we're looking for. But uh, the other way, and, and we know some mobile technology could also, you know, uh, integrate some uh, reading capacity, uh, maybe not of the retina, <laughs> but uh, uh, of the eye in itself and some part of the eye, maybe the transparency or some other thing you could see on the, on the, on the camera could also be, you know, a, a solution uh, to be deployed. So I like that example because I think it, it shows, you know, the, the, the complexity be, be, between the medical need and then after the complexity of deployment that you have to go through a whole chain to make sure that you know it can hit the market, the patient, the healthcare system, and so on and so forth. And something that we did not discuss, but I think it's also important, and it has a, a uh, what do you say, that it has a link with the infrastructure and the way you deploy it. If we follow what we did with medicines, and I'm thinking about immunotherapy, uh, we know up front because we did clinical trial that it, it, it should work on some patient and for and by my chance, it will not work on some, on some other patients. Sometimes we don't know why. It's not more risky, but it's just that you know, it doesn't work as we could have expected in some patients. And I think AI, in a way, you know, it will behave in real life, will also be something we should look in real life. So this infrastructure we will deploy should also have a mechanism to make sure that we can evaluate the technology in real life as well. So, you know, it, it's also something important to think of when you go on a market is to make sure that your product is efficient and secure, but remains efficient and remains secure as is uh, being on the market and, uh, and does what it does. So I think that's, that's, that's uh, another constraint that we, we know more and more with some new, very innovative drugs that, that will, that is already and will be a reality for uh, AI deployment to be uh, to be considered. I see. Yeah, thank you. There's also, also a point of uh, energy efficiency because uh, AI, as we all know, is consume a lot and a lot of energy, and um, uh, I think that really is, uh, I mean, ecological concerns. And uh, and Marwan at Huawei is that also one of yeah, your concerns? Yeah, um, it's a big concern for us. Uh, there's a very interesting paper from. Uh, from MIT guys, which was published last July, uh, showcasing basically that uh, the biggest progress which have been made in uh, machine learning in the last 20 years were not from an algorithmic perspective, but more from a, a computing perspective. And we know it. I mean, basically all the algorithms that we're using today date back from the 90s. Of course, there's been, of course, some, some, uh, some improvements. But basically, the majority of all the, the frameworks, uh, DNN, RNN, CNN, whatever, are based basically on algorithms which date from the 90s, which means that basically what we're gaining today is mostly from the computing, and this is consuming a lot. And the projection they're giving is basically that uh, there would be basically in a couple of years, if there is not a big change in the way the architecture, machine learning algorithms, a new what I call winter for AI. So we need to avoid that. So I'm not going to be talking about that at the moment, but today we're already seeing this with the devices we're having. Uh, we're providing to many, I would say, of our patients uh, wearables. Uh, these are smartwatch, which are like Fitbit, which enable you, of course, to get 
uh, the beats, the heartbeats of the people, and then measure things. And as you all know, they have a, a given autonomy. And that autonomy is extremely complicated uh, to put forward, uh, basically because of the computing resources that we put in that. Uh, today, the way we're, we're trying to, to solve that is basically to uh, re-engineer uh, uh, basically classical machine learning algorithms to bring them into a lower precision, what we call low precision AI. What I mean by that is that imagine today that basically when you run a, a neural network, uh, you uh, impose that uh, the weights uh, that you have in your neural networks can only have, for example, binary features, what we call binary neural networks. And in that case, when you have binary networks, of course, all the classical algorithms which are based, for example, on gradient descent cannot work because, uh, 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 I mean, learning, by the way, is optimization. Optimization is doing a derivation, a derivative. And der doing a derivative in binary is not possible. So applying the classical, I would say, tools cannot work anymore. And you have to revisit how you look at the problem of, uh, of doing machine learning when you impose that uh, basically you can only have uh, uh, zero and ones uh, uh, for uh, the manipulation that you do. And if you relook at the problem, for example, in the specific case I'm giving you, then uh, optimization in binary is a combinatorial problem. And as you know, the gates are quite open when you look at optimization in, combina in, in combinatorial because we have many heuristics. And we've been, of course, building uh, a lot of these uh, 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 BNN frameworks to lower down basically the, 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 the complexity, but also the consumption that we're having. And there are tremendous gains by going on that approach. Of course, that's not the only one, the only way to go. We have also all the specific cases of how you specify more deeply, basically, a certain learning features. And for example, if we take our chipsets that we're selling today in the markets, uh, we have, for example, in a given chipset, a Kirin, which is on a smartphone, we have a couple of NPUs. So what is an NPU? It's a neural processing unit. And we have an NPU which does a specific task related to image recognition. We have an NPU which does a specific task to a speech recognition, you go on like that. Of course, we would be very happy to have a global, I uh, would say, way of doing that, that, but at the stage, it's not possible. And the approach today is mostly about more focusing to reduce the consumption. And, and, and for example, in the, in, the, in the extreme case of IoT, well, we've been building some very light, I would say, uh, computing mechanisms for our OET device, because as you know, for IoT, people are asking us uh, 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 some time frames which go from, from two years to 10 years. That's the first aspect. The second aspect also, which, which is quite important, is also how you handle the data. And basically, within your infrastructure in terms of energy efficiency, you bring back and forth. And this is, of course, consuming a lot of the resources in terms of bandwidth that you're having in a network. And of course, this is where uh, basically uh, Nigel was, 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 was talking about uh, these federated IDs. And, and today, uh, distributed, I would say, AI techniques have become a bit of, 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 of something ubiquitous uh, for these mechanisms. Of course, the, the problem of privacy for sure is there, but also the problem of energy efficiency. Because basically, of course, when you start uh, compressing uh, locally your data by creating some kind of model and for which um, you only exchange basically uh, the weights and the number of layers that you have so that you can federate them. So, of course, federated learning uh, uh, is one aspect for doing that, but you have uh, other techniques which do uh, distributed AI, uh, also lower down basically the complexity, but also the consumption. Um, I think in these techniques where we don't want uh, basically uh, data to overflow our network and basically starting having this exchange and where we can take some kind of local compression by doing this modeling, the biggest issue we have today is mostly about scaling, okay? Uh, you have to know that we're talking about a massive amount of connected devices that we have within the hospital. Uh, more or less when we take this at, at the global case of, of people living in a city where you want to monitor them, it's a much larger scale. I think, for example, uh, 5G is talking about uh, 1 million objects per kilometer square, which gives you a rough number of how many connected devices you have. And, and building massive distributed AI techniques, uh, basically for which data 
is not moving but is treated locally uh, it is certainly still a big issue for us. We're handling it with, uh, I would say, still heuristics, but we don't have the right framework uh, to go around that. Yeah, thank you, Mehran. You mentioned so energy efficiency and privacy, which uh, are coming together. So, Nigel, you, you, you talked about that. Uh, so, this uh, aspect of uh, privacy, ethics, GDPR. Can you explain us a bit more uh, all these concepts now? Uh, it's impacting your, your sure. Your no, thank you, uh, Stanley. I'll, I'll try and keep it brief, but this is an enormous subject in its own, like many of the things we've covered today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we we are currently in a challenge, certainly European setting, but certainly internationally around uh, going back to talking about data for a moment, but take, keeping data open enough to be able to conduct research, for instance, and to support things like machine learning and AI, but but closed enough to protect citizen security and privacy and so on. Um, so it starts, I think, in terms of where the data emanates from and being able to, to inter utilize it for supporting ML and, and AI and, and, and such. Um, but it also moves beyond that in terms of application, as has been mentioned by many of the panelists today, in a clinical setting, but moreover also that transparency of uh, of of uh, you know trustworthiness of of, of the uh, of the algorithms and so on as well. Some of you may be familiar with this story, and I'll, I'll briefly allude to it. But I think it was last year, maybe the year before. I think it was the year before. Um, but Apple uh, brought out a credit card with uh, good, um, with uh, Goldman Sachs, who actually had never produced a credit card before, which I was surprised at. And as a story, you can Google it. Uh, other search engines obviously are available as well. Uh, but Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of, uh, of Apple, uh, raised concerns because it, it transpired that his credit limit was much higher than his wife's. And there seemed to be some inherent bias, which was borne out through later research, uh, that, uh, that females uh, using the Apple credit card got much lower credit limits than males. So we are all cognizant, of course, of the inherent challenges of bias. But think of it in a clinical setting. What if that was, for instance, uh, radiation dosing for, for a cancer, for tumors? And based on some inherent bias in some algorithms, um, people, whether it's due to gender or other reasons, receive different doses, maybe abnormal dosing, for instance, too high or too low, both of which create harm. Um, so th these are inherent challenges that are much more rarefied, if you like, in the clinical domain. You know, okay, it's unfortunate in a credit card setting that there's a gender difference and a bias, and we can probably get over it. Um, but in a clinical setting, that could potentially be harmful, if not even fatal. So the, so the level, if you like, the threshold of concern is that much higher, and therefore the, the necessity to ensure transparency uh, as we look at uh, artificial intelligence, algorithm, machine learning as, as products in their own right, is really, really critical. So there's all these kind of requirements in terms of transparency for a start. Um, clearly, companies like our own at Janssen, as we heard also from Roche and from, from, from others, certainly in the pharmaceutical domain, uh, are readily you know, concerned about this and working closely with regulators around this. I think it comes back to an early comment, I think from you, Remy, at the start, about how few have been actually regulated and have met, have, have met you know, majors of the market, Kel Sabris, and that's probably a limit of my French, my apologies, but, but, um, but certainly also, I think, in terms of uh, general data protection regulations and other requirements and this kind of socio-technical construct, again, um, you know, it's not just the technology, it's not just the methodologies, but it's also the assurance that you're compliant with the requirements, whatever they may be locally, nationally, and internationally, whether it's you know, GDPR here in, in Europe, uh, can, can similarly for, for the California Act in the United States. Um, there is also now a Data Governance Act that came out late last year, which is kind of putting more flesh to the bones, if you like, of GDPR. One of the problems with GDPR, not intrinsically as a regulation, is actually that we've had a challenge, not so much around um the the regulation interpretation of gdpr which has lent real challenges of its implementation it's too it's too often too easy to say no rather than to uh, respond to to, to utilization of data so uh, so you guys often use an excuse the data governance act which came out late last year i think reiterated that there is actually uh, quite an open field for utilizing data for research within gdpr further law will, will come uh, this year 
to further reinforce that. Um, but again, reiterates around uh, the, the guiding principles. You know, you know everything from uh, from from being able you know, the ability to be forgotten, for instance. What does that mean in terms of that data being used? Uh, you know, for 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 prediction work going forward in the future, or using using an algorithm. Um, so, so, so there are all sorts of interpretation challenges, which I think are difficult enough when we're using real world data for observational research, considerably more difficult when it's really understanding how we can use real world data, observational or otherwise, um, in, in terms of sporting artificial intelligence work. But that end to end transparency is going to grow as a major need, I think, particularly in the technical setting, if not wider. Um, and it's something that I think many of us are scratching our heads over and working to understand uh, beyond the technical aspect, but more the socio aspects in terms of ethical deployment of, uh, of these types of tools and so forth. But importantly, um, you know, how you, you will ensure that you, you guard against bias and also going forward in the future that you are uh, transparently updating an algorithm, for instance, and what impact that has on the decision making and so on and so forth requires a lot of study. It requires a lot more further data, but it clearly requires an awful lot of evidence, which at the moment I think, you know, there's a real, real challenge I think going forward, particularly in a regulatory framework as well. So uh, not necessarily many, many answers there and probably more questions, um, but it's something that any researcher and anyone working in this field needs to be extremely mindful of in terms of the eventual deployment and application of any tools that they or products that they create. Absolutely. Um, there were some uh, last words about uh, the way you implement uh, AI in, in, in the real world. Sorry, can you repeat your question? <laughs> uh, do you have more more experience to share with us uh, with respect to your the, the activities of Huawei in the, the yeah so, of, uh, um, so first of all I like to make a very fast comment I'm seeing the live chat and there was a question about this energy footprint which I think is quite relevant in 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 the way we're we're doing the businesses um, uh, the, the 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 comment was about Lorient about the the the, the computational I would say power of of AI. Uh, which, which I think is quite important in terms of, of, of stamping or certifying some kind of, 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 of technologies that we're building. And, and this is a right point, and I had this experience already, uh, this is just a comment to Lorient, about the fact that many people are even using today in AI for improving the energy efficiency of networks, okay? Because of course, you know, trying to understand how you optimize basically the energy efficiency of a network is quite complicated and you start using AI. But then you don't consider the energy consumed by AI to do that optimization. And of course, you need basically to really understand what I call here the end-to-end -end performance and being able also to take into account that, I would say, crashing of data, which also requires a lot of energy. So of course, you save energy because you use those techniques in a very smart manner, but then you don't consider all basically the energy that you use to be able to understand what's happening. And I think, of course, this end-to-end -end point is, is quite missing. Second thing what, that I like to mention is that many are also of, of our communication network um, until 4G and even 5G has been tailored uh, with either broadband or also industry 4.0. There hasn't been, been a lot of, of network infrastructure which has been built with, I would say, health or e-health, I would say, constraints. And this is, by the way, what we are considering today within uh, let's the next releases of, of, of uh, the three GBP standardization is really to understand these constraints that we have in terms of privacy, in terms of latency, in terms of coverage and all these aspects and how we have to re-adapt our infrastructure today so that we can cope with all this uh, pervasive data, which is basically located nearly everywhere. And I think um, uh, one of the big things about um, the application of AI in eHealth today is what I call the pervasive AI aspect about it, in the sense that um, it, it's really spread around. And then you need to build some very smart techniques to be able to capture it with the very, I would say, specific constraints that we have within the industry uh, of health. And and I, and, and, and I go mentioned them. Uh, uh, these privacy, of course, issues are extremely important, but there are many also other aspects related to, to, to health and reliability that is extremely important uh, in the sense of when you start doing, you know, a distance, I would say, control 
of, of insulin injection or something like that, uh, networks today are not enough reliable uh, to send basically that information. You can't do that on a 4G network today, typically. Uh, uh, you're taking a huge risk. Uh, of course, the way we do it today is backing up. I mean, when you look at these remote operations, in general, uh, you have three or four backups, which are basically your fiber line, but you do wireless and things like that. I think we really need to build some, some reliable infrastructures, uh, uh, which are able to cope with the extreme reliability issues that we have with the health uh, cases where a connection cannot stop with that. Um, I have, of course, many examples that I can give that we've been building with this experience that we had with this pandemic in China within these 10 days. For example, in this AI assisted diagnosis, where a huge massive number, as you know, of patients were coming in the hospital and for which we needed to be able to provide basically quite rapidly a report on a detection scheme. Um, in the classical fully manual uh, techniques where we had a doctor doing a diagnosis uh, and, and looking basically, of course, uh, at 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 uh, at at um, uh, um, uh, the, the the measurements which were done on the patient. It took us roughly around 12 minutes when a doctor does this manually, and then typing the report either by him or the secretary would take you two minutes. That's roughly the time, which is around 15 to 60 minutes. When you do this AI, uh, basically end-to-end -end perspective, Huawei let's say AI or whatever AI technique plus doctor, an AI di diagnosis will take you around 10 seconds. The doctor confirmation, because you need a doctor to confirm the result because you won't take any risk, is around two minutes, okay? And then basically when you do the reporting, it's quite automatic that it's 30 seconds. You have a gain of really a factor of six with respect by using doctor plus AI with respect to classical doctor. And uh, this whole scheme, of course, made things speed up in a quite uh, a drastic manner uh, with the massive number of patients that we had coming in the hospital and the queues so that we could, of course, be more efficient in treating our patients. And these cases, I think, will come more and more in the future. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you all for all your, for sharing your thoughts and, and, uh, and experience with us. It was very, very insightful for, for, for all of us. Uh, we are running a bit late, so I mean, it's time to conclude. Um, I think there's a lot of hype and marketing and communication about AI. And I mean, you did a great job uh, to unveil some of the real and concrete challenges and difficulties that we have when we work in this domain. And so thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, looking to the future, I would like to ask you a very final question to all of you. So how do you see the future of AI for Health beyond hype? Um, in one maybe, world, in one uh, outcome driven, and I will put a, a mm -hmm. third one then trust. <laughs> trust. Pervasive, you, pervasive, pervasive AI. Morning. I think I said it uh, nearly at any point. <laughs> Not a cloud AI. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I Who think it's uh, collaborations from uh, from me. Um, I think uh, we we and um, we need a contribution from both uh, clinician and uh, data scientists uh, and support clinicians and not replace them but uh, collaborate with them. You've all come up with great points, of course. Um, but, but one thing I would say, I'd use the word global. I, I think we need to be thinking actually on a global scale for utilizing this kind of work, not too parochial, not too local. Um, you know, we have the ability now to impact at scale across multiple millions, if not billions of people going forward in the future. And we need to be mindful of that, of all the pros and the cons. So paradigm shifting potentially. So I think we need to be thinking more, more globally. Thank you very much. A huge thanks to, to the four of you uh, for participating in this uh, roundtable and for your company for supporting the AI for Health Winter School and your support is very, very much appreciated. Um, I have also one announcement to make. So uh, on the main web page of, uh, of the conferencing system, you have all the, the partnerships that are listed and especially the gold and diamond uh, partners. So, and you could uh, set up a face-to-face -face meeting with a representative of these companies and organization if you'd like to interact with them. So 
uh, for anyone in the audience, um, maybe it's uh, already uh, up, uh, set up, or maybe it will be uh, uh, it will be already early um, early tomorrow. So you can uh, you can create a meeting with uh, with one of uh, of our uh, representative and, and have a face to face meeting with them. Uh, of course, provided they are available. So uh, thank you very much again. Thank you very much for all this audience who uh, just uh, followed us all the all the way through, and uh, hope to see you soon and uh, to learn more about your projects. Hey. Have you a good evening or thank good you. morning or good whatever. Take care, guys. Thank, thank you. you.